And now I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker this afternoon, Mr. Jeffrey Simpson. Jeffrey is the most decorated journalist in Canada, an officer of the Order of Canada. He has also received seven honorary doctorates and numerous, numerous national writing awards, including the Governor General's Prize and the Donner Prize for the best book on public policy. For 32 years, his Excuse me, for 32 years, his national affairs column in the Globe and Mail was essential reading for decision makers and informed Canadians across the country. In that column and in hundreds of public speeches and lectures, he ranged over an enormous number of domestic and international issues from politics to healthcare, from climate change to economic and fiscal policy to Canadian American relations and, Middle East, and the Middle East. He retired from column writing at the Globe and Mail in, in mid-2016, but he continues to lecture and speak on many of the leading issues of the day. He has written eight books, numerous magazine articles, appeared regularly on television in English and French, and was a guest lecturer at many universities. Jeffrey has taught as an adjunct professor at Queen's University Institute of Policy Studies and the University of Ottawa Law School. He is Senior Fellow at the University of Ottawa Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Welcome, Jeffrey. Thanks so much for coming back to our conference and presenting again. Uh, we really look forward to this. Thank you. Well, Susan, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you again. Mesdames et Messieurs, il fait plaisir de me retrouver avec vous. Uh, Susan, I was surprised four years ago, and then again last year, when I was invited to speak at the CTO conference. Uh, you mentioned a book I wrote on healthcare, so I know a little bit about that, but about medicine, very little. Indeed, I was reminded of uh, the old master of ceremonies who, when asked to thank a speaker, said, we must ask Mr. So-and-so back when he has less time. Well, I'm honored today to have 30 minutes and then to take a few questions and dodge your brick bats. So here goes. It's a cliche now to say what a difference a year makes. I don't think anybody at the beginning of 2020 could have guessed that something called the Corona-19 virus would so warp our lives, cause so many deaths, smash so much of the economy, throw government finances into a tailspin, read the Ontario budget yesterday, influence geopolitics, and perhaps the outcome of the U.S. election and raise so many questions about the preparedness or the lack thereof of our societies and our governments. My long writing career was littered with uh, mistakes and erroneous predictions, as my critics often reminded me. But occasionally, just occasionally, there was a rose that appeared among the thorns. And in July 2005, July 2005, I penned a column that had the bizarre headline, warning, this column will frighten you, keep away from children. It argued that, quote, the world's biggest threat isn't terrorism, it's flu. Yes, flu. I was wrong about flu, but not about pandemics, because what I called in that column the kind of virus that could travel fast and be virulent is a serious threat. And by the time a vaccine is produced, I wrote, many people in infected areas can die. And I cited a 2005 report from the U.S. National Intelligence Council that looked ahead to 2020, last year, and said that a, goal, a global pandemic was the most important threat to the global economy. Well, with this last quote, I'll stop referring to myself. But I did write in that 2005 column that, quote, the global literature about the likelihood of a pandemic, probably a flu, here I was wrong in detail, but not essence, is filled with quasi-apocalyptic apocalyptic material, millions dead, billions of dollars disrupted, serious security concerns. And the damnable thing I continued about these viruses is that they change. So just when you think that science has got ahead of them, well, they transmute into something else. So a rose among thorns once in a while. There were many warnings then and later about pandemics, more severe than SARS and HSN1. If even an untrained and often wrongheaded observer like me could figure out that we needed to prepare for precisely we didn't know what, but for some sort of major pandemic, then people smarter than myself should have seen that. That we didn't is among the reasons why we have lived through the last 13 months. But in fairness, 
as a longtime observer of governments, I can say that government's hardest decisions are to spend money and expend energy on something either people don't believe will happen or believe that when it does happen, they'll have time to respond. And the urgency of today's problems and the short term of election cycles pushes off to a distant day, the planning for the known unknowns. So we're gathered here to talk about clinical trials. And if nothing else, if nothing else, COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of such trials, which have contributed vitally to the vaccines that we are now seeing. Lessons learned or forgotten, however, require a steely-eyed analysis of the pluses and minuses of where we are as a country and as a province. And I'm going to offer a few thoughts, not as a medical person, about what economists call externalities, which is a fancy word for saying factors that don't dictate outcome of events, such as the outcome of clinical trials, but influence events through talent pools, competitive economic policies, government decisions, cultural attitudes. So where are we in Canada? Where were we in Canada pre-pandemic, comparatively speaking, in clinical trials writ large? Well, some of you undoubtedly know this data, which comes from the US National Library of Medicine. And we all know that you can play with numbers to make almost any case that you want. But in 2019, according to that data, there were 328,700 registered clinical trials around the world, of which there were 128,000 in the United States, 94,000 in Europe, 5,700 in Japan, and 21,000 in Canada. These are rough figures. They don't state the stage of the trials, the number of participants, the results. And of the registered trials, only 8% or 41,000 have posted results. And researchers in these trials can be spread among a number of countries, as you know. But with these qualifications, Canada didn't come out badly. After all, the Canada-US population ratio is about 1 to 10, but the clinical trials ratio, according to that data, was about 1 to 4. And the Canadian-European ratio was also favorable. And Canada had about four times as many posted trials as Japan an advanced industrial country with a much larger population. But nonetheless, the clinical trials competition, if I can use that word, is intensifying, especially as China, as in so many other fields, has entered the world picture. There have been many well-documented problems with conducting clinical trials in China, from the technical to the reliability of reported results to long, inconsistent authorization times. One study of China's practices a few years ago noted, quote, a hospital-based research network with limited knowledge of good clinical practices, resulting in problems as records being changed without audit trails being created. But things are changing in China as authorities have overhauled procedures. Companies can get drugs approved in China from data generated overseas, and in the last five years, from what I read, Chinese authorities have slashed wait times for learning about whether a clinical trial can be undertaken. They have recognized, they, the Chinese, have recognized that becoming more prominent in developing breakthrough pharmaceuticals fits with the country's long-term ambitions of being the world leader, or at least among the world leaders, in a wide range of technologies and what flows from them. AI, electric vehicles, renewable energies, and yes, medical research leading to commercialization. And several important Chinese government documents have indicating, indicated what that state has in mind. As long ago as 2006, the state council there published a landmark document called National Medium and Long-Term Plan for the Development of Science and Technology. 2006 to 2020 is what that report was about. And it was based on what it called indigenous innovation with the goal of China becoming a quote, science and technology power by the middle of the 21st century. Other state documents followed, all premised on China becoming a technology driven leader, including, and mention of this is made in the documents, biotechnologies and pharmaceuticals. 
And these ambitions are focused, hugely financed by private and public funds, backed by a burgeoning higher education system at home and involving some of the thousands and thousands of Chinese st studying abroad, including in Western countries, who will bring the knowledge that they learned in those countries back to China. And China, as we know, produced its own vaccine for COVID-19, which began in that country, a fact the authorities covered up in the earliest stages. And China is now sending that vaccine to countries for free as part of what it calls vaccine diplomacy. So in such a competitive international environment, it's worth noting among other initiatives in Canada, the nine step recommendation from the Canadian Clinical Trials Coordinating Center and Quebec's Catalysis Clinical Trials Initiative designed to spur activity in that province. And there have been some encouraging steps towards streamlining approval and regulatory processes surrounding clinical trials. All is good, but I would simply say insufficient because international competition is intensifying and will intensify to conduct trials that hopefully will lead to innovations and new patents. And if a continuing process of improvement and streamlining in creating the right environment for clinical trials doesn't become the norm, then Canada runs the risk of losing some of the results that it has achieved. All of you know much better than I do how hard it is sometimes to get clinical trials started, to see them through to the end and achieve demonstrably positive results at the finish. We are in awe, I'm in awe at any rate, at the speed with which clinical trials were conducted and produced the vaccines for COVID-19 and its variants. I well remember as somebody not skilled in these fields, and some of you do too, that many, many epidemiologists and others scoffed at the idea that we could have vaccines for this particular virus so swiftly. It doesn't always happen this way. Many of you will have read the coverage a while ago about the dispiriting results of the latest clinical trials into Alzheimer's in the United States. Could this dreadful malady be stopped if treatment began before symptoms appeared? And for five years, individuals were given experimental drugs in a trial sponsored by Washington University in St. Louis, plus two companies that supplied the drugs the National Institutes of Health and Medical Philanthropies, and the result, alas, was no progress. Perhaps the drugs weren't given early enough, perhaps the dosages weren't right, perhaps focusing on amyloid was the wrong target. Another much more positive story concerned the results of a phase three clinical trial that showed that the medication Neurotide, developed by a private Toronto-based company, No No Inc., reduces the mortality rate of strokes from 19 to 11%. In the public reporting about that trial, how much money was spent wasn't reported, but the project was overseen by two Calgary doctors, took two years, involved more than a thousand patients at almost 50 stroke hospitals around the world. Evidence of the effort, the time, and the international scope of important clinical trials. So notwithstanding this important and successful trial and others and others in Canada, we do have the Canadian challenge of lacking enough domestic venture capital in many fields, not just biotechnology. Biotech startups do often struggle to find the funds they need to get going and to keep going. I like to quote Cedric Bisson, who is a partner with the Turalis Capital, one of the top funders of biotech in Canada, and he summed up the dilemma. He said, despite the successes and the financial returns, it's still difficult to mobilize generalist Canadian investors in the asset class because of their lack of understanding of a sector that typically delivers either huge investor wins or sharp sell-offs, depending on the results of high-risk trials. And his comments came pre-pandemic. One wonders what the pandemic and its vaccines will do to change impressions. Happily, some foreign venture capital is moving into Canada such that venture capital firms, Canadian and foreign, invested more money in Canadian biotech firms, almost a billion dollars indeed in 2019 than in any previous year. So the direction is right. We just need to keep going in that direction and faster. Clinical trials go forward in Canada in part in the context, as you know, of our healthcare system and my 
remarks today aren't about the healthcare system overall, except to say that in the decade after the book that I wrote, Chronic Condition, appeared in 2012, remarkably little, it seems to me, has fundamentally changed. This, the diagnosis that I offered in those pages remains, I think, by and large the same, a system with excellence and, and speed for those who are very sick, especially for those who are in genuine emergency situations, a system with a high degree of medical skill and dedication by those who work within it, but one that when measured against other countries with largely publicly financed medical services remains plagued by balkanization in too many places, wait times that are frustratingly long, especially for so-called non-life-threatening problems, a shortage of doctors and hospital beds, and we see in this pandemic of long-term care facilities. And as we discovered in the pandemic, too many of those facilities, alas, were understaffed and ill-regulated. To my enduring surprise, these problems, which are not new, elicit kind of shrugs from the Canadian public as if nothing can ever change, and predictable shouts of defiance from healthcare analysts and universities and various lobby groups who insist that any change is dangerous. Medicare in Canada is an ideology, and ideologies are a rigid framework of entrenched ideas and repetitive affirming slogans demanding unconditional acceptance of prevailing ways of thought. They're very tough to change. But we do face an immutable fact. Our population is aging, which means more chronic conditions, more hospital beds being taken up, more drug use, and more costs from the public treasury, since aging also means, also means, and people forget this, fewer people in the workforce relative to those outside the workforce rather than those who are in it, and therefore fewer revenues for the state at the very moment when aging places additional spending demands on the state. Now, to the extent, of course, that successful clinical trials can lead to improved treatments, ideally at local cost, a lower cost, trials are steps in absolutely essential directions. And although we've all been preoccupied with COVID-19 and the vaccine for us, you, more than anybody know, that trials are conducted and remain important for all sorts of medical challenges. We might be too late for the COVID train, but as with any train system, there are many destinations. And the organization of trials and the conducting and analyzing of them, and eventually, in a few cases, the commercialization of them takes a long time, occurs away from the public eye, whereas other aspects of the healthcare medical systems are visible and pressing, and therefore get short-term attention from political leaders, policymakers, and of course, patients and the general public. In recent years, the last decade or so, the increase in overall healthcare spending per year has dropped nationally from 7% down to about 3 or 4%. With medical inflation costs being at about 4%, the spending hasn't quite caught up with cost pressures, which has in turn caused governments to look for savings. And since one of the big drivers, the big three, of healthcare costs is the pharmaceutical component, the others being hospitals and doctors, eyes have inevitably been turned to the cost of pharmaceuticals, which again, as many of you know, are comparatively high against costs in other Western countries apart from the United States. Searching for the proper balance between cost containment and innovation in drug policy provides no perfect answer. But with a left of center liberal government in Ottawa dependent on survival from the NDP, two trends have emerged. A series of non committal statements moving Canada towards something like a national pharmacare program, the overall cost of which the liberals have kind of come to understand would be quite high, and a desire to bring down the cost of brand name drugs. To that end, as you know, the liberals have proposed changes, changing the comparable countries of the Patent Medicine Prices Review Board. Those are the prices that must be used in assessing drug prices in Canada. And the effect of these changes, the government hopes and believes, will over time reduce costs. The question is at what long-term price in other matters? If brand name companies as a result leave or reduce research efforts in Canada, what happens to, among other things, clinical trials? I criticize myself to some extent here because 
I, like others in that book I wrote and in other writings, focused on the cost. I recommended years ago what the government has proposed to do in adjusting the comparable countries for the PMPRB. I further argued, and this has not been done, that we should have a national drug formulary with negotiations being conducted on the province's behalf by Ottawa. But the pandemic, I think, has ought to, think, ought, ought to cause us to reflect. There's a school of thought among some quite influential academic writers about drug policy and prices that we are being ripped off by the brand name companies. They refer in their writings to New Zealand, which has lower prices to be sure, but almost no R&D investment, let alone physical installation by patent medicine drug companies. So yes, we could do a New Zealand and hand much more of the markets to generics, but say goodbye to R&D or in partnership with research elsewhere, clinical trials say goodbye to many of them and jobs apart from those of salespeople. It is very, very verifiable that the deal we made many years ago under the Mulroney government, whereby increased patent protection would produce a quid pro quo in the form of an increase in R&D in Canada has not worked out as it was planned. The R&D part of the bargain materialized for a while, but then it faded. And remember, this is a highly competitive international business and Canada by world standards as a small country with a population of 37 million people. The United States have 10 times as many people. The European Union have almost 400, 450 million people. Ask ourselves, where would we be today in this pandemic without the capacities of the research intensive drug companies? Has any generic drug company produced a vaccine or tried to research one? If a country, to put this bluntly, wants to play on this field of research, which involves clinical trials, let alone build an internal manufacturing capacity, it's going to need brand name companies presence. And the question is, will the presence be largely or exclusively overseas or will some of it be here? And the answer last time was exclusively overseers. We were and still are at the mercy of our pocketbooks and the production of vaccines overseas. We even tried to cut a deal how foolish was this with a Chinese company to produce something in Montreal? It fell through. And now it proposes the government to have a modernized NRC lab in Montreal where the Novavax vaccine is gonna be made up and running, but in December, 2021. I have to say that the Minister of Industry, who's the indefatigable Francois Champagne, is vigorously chasing with a big checkbook companies to set up shop. So, the pandemic and the preparations required for the next one should, I think, force us to rethink what has been a generally hostile attitude towards big brand name companies and try in a serious and civilized way to reach some new understandings about their role and place in the Canadian economy and healthcare world. But I would add something else. Private companies are proficient at commercializing and actualizing basic research through clinical trials, for example, but there's a very, very important role for governments in funding basic research of the kind companies are often loath to undertake. And therefore we need more investments in the universities and research centers to do that kind of basic research. As for national pharmacare, this isn't the time or the place for a long dissertation on the proposal. I would just say that the reason the liberals are hesitating is because there's a very substantial cost involved. We have to face the fact that Canada will always be handicapped because brand name drug company head offices aren't located here. So do we have the right policies, that being the case, for attracting and encouraging talent that is already here and bringing more talent into Canada from abroad? Do we have the right educational institutions? Do we have the right incentives for science and technology and innovation? Well, on the talent front, having spent 15 years on the board of two Canadian universities, I would say that the talent and facilities at post-secondary educational institutions here are reasonably good by world standards. We don't have that many universities in the top 50, although the University Health Network in Toronto was ranked third best in the world in a survey for Newsweek magazine. But uh, we have a lot of good universities, a few very good universities. We have three ranked universities in the top 80, U of T, McGill and UBC a group of second tier universities and a whole bunch of third or even fourth tier schools. We do therefore have some clusters of talent sufficient 
to be competitive. And we have government programs like the Canada Research Chairs, Genome Canada, and the medical granting agencies that provide a good superstructure, policy superstructure for sustaining talent. And government policies now make it easier for foreign students to remain in Canada after their studies. And all Canadian universities are trying harder and harder to attract more foreign students. Although as a former board member, let's be frank, the reason we're doing that is because the amount of money our governments are giving universities is in decline in absolute terms or real terms. And so we need more money. So we get it from higher fees from foreign students, but that's a whole other story. But the brain gain is much to our advantage. We should be aware, however, mercifully, that the Trump nightmare years are over, but that will mean that US immigration policies will become less restrictive, thereby intensifying the competition for talent. And it's worth noting too, that in passing, our high school education results by world standards are good. In the OECD PISA tests of 15 year olds, the results from which date from 2018, Canadian students rank fifth in the world for reading compared to 12th in the United States, ninth for mathematics compared to uh, a much lower standard in the United States, 37th, and sixth in science compared to the US 14th. I mention this only to say that we do have high school students in math and science, while behind a few of the top Asian countries suggest a stream of talent in those fields heading to the universities. And the government does plan to bring to Canada each year for the next three years and beyond over 400,000 immigrants and 22% roughly of Canada's population is comprised of immigrants or permanent residents. So if Canada stays on its current course, a policy of admitting many immigrants on the, on the basis of a point system, which includes language skills, educational levels, and job prospects, I think we will continue to have a secure stream of talent and a competitive advantage over many countries either that don't attract or want any immigrants, Japan, China, Poland, attract fewer immigrants of higher educational achievement, France, or make it harder to become citizens, Germany. Finally, there's a very important demographic factor that contributes to being optimistic, and that's the role of women. Women now comprise close to a majority, and in some cases, a healthy majority in fields where several decades they lack behind their share of the population, medicine, pharmacology, optometry, business law, architecture, women, are a large majority in the social sciences and arts faculties and therefore comprise well over 50% of the student body at most Canadian universities. And they get into universities in greater percentages than men for many reasons, principal of which is that their high school marks are better. Their marks are high, they win more scholarships, their aspirations are great, their talents are awesome. And more of them are turning these talents towards sciences and engineering. Female enrollments in these areas is rising, although more slowly perhaps than might be desirable. But as more role models are presented of women succeeding in these fields as they already are in medicine, the share of women in what are called the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and math will rise. And women already represent more than 50% of undergraduate places in biological sciences in university. But it should be said and underscored that women are less likely than men to pursue science degrees to the master's and doctoral levels. To kindle more interest, the Trudeau government introduced a kind of, they don't call it this, but it is an affirmative action program for research chairs and grants in science requiring that 50% of them go to women, even in areas where women only comprise 25% of the pool. You can like this approach, you can dislike this approach, but this is what's happening. So more women in science will be, I think, a great boon for a country like Canada compared to other countries where the progress of women in these fields is slower. Again, think of Japan and China and certain European countries to say nothing of Russia, the Middle East or Mexico. These rates of female achievement will, with immigration, provide, I think, steady additional streams of talent for the kind of experimental and cutting edge work done in clinical trials and related areas. I think there are therefore reasons from, for immigration and female advancement to be optimistic about the future pool of talent for Canada in this and other scientific fields. Of course, there's never enough money to go around to meet the needs of research. There are government programs, SHRED, for example, that are available and are used. But I have to say, I don't like to say this, but I have to say that the pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic biomedical research field, although vital, wasn't necessarily the flavor of the month. 
the honor for which gave, went to sustainable energy technologies, in part because the issues of climate change is important sui generis and because diseases and research into them have been around for a long time, whereas figuring out how to store huge amounts of energy and batteries, how to create electric vehicles, how to do everything we've done while using less energy and to do it in new ways seem to have a greater sense of urgency. I searched the party platforms in the last federal election and they were full of the usual assortment of lofty promises, some of them delusional, many of which dealt with financing and engineering challenges of solving climate change. None dealt with financing the challenges of biomedicine. So I hope, I hope, that this gruesome pandemic and our country's limitations in research and clinical fields leading to vaccines will make biomedicine worthy of much more urgent attention. I conclude, therefore, by evincing guarded optimism about the talent streams, the public policies, the financial resources, and the medical know-how to present a better future for clinical trials. But I repeat, I repeat what you all must know, that the competition for money and talent will not relent if anything, with a greater Chinese presence in this field, it will intensify. And that's why conferences such as this are so useful to exchange ideas, to prod each other, to send messages to governments, and to focus on policies that will help create more clinical trials in Canada or international trials in which Canada participates, so that the next time a pandemic strikes, we won't be the bystanders that we've been this time. Thank you very much. I look forward to whatever questions you have. And you can't throw any brickbats at me directly. So I'm okay. <laughs> One of the many advantages of a virtual conference. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for your talk. We do have some time for questions here and I have a few lined up for you. So I'll kick things off with a big one. You mentioned that governments are challenged in spending money on things that might happen. And right now, there's a lot of talk about the importance of research and developing therapeutics at home. So how long do you think this, with this current pandemic will be remembered? And in other words, what do you think the window of opportunity will be for getting commitments so that we can build the infrastructure and investment we need to support ongoing clinical trials, research, and domestic supply of health solutions? It's a great question to which I don't have a definitive answer. I can only say that this disruption has been beyond any disruption that we have uh, ever experienced uh, in our lifetime. You have to go back to the Spanish flu to get anything that's uh, comparable to this. Uh, terrorism, certainly, if you think about 9-11, focused the attention of the government of Canada in a major way and influenced a lot of ways in which we do things, as anybody who flies knows. Mm -hmm. But I think this is even more profound because it touched uh, almost every Canadian in one form or another, either because they contracted the disease or because they feared it or because they were subjected to measures by government to prevent its spread. And there's apprehension in the country, obviously, about vaccinations and how fast will they arrive, all that sort of stuff. So everybody in one form or another has been touched by this, directly or indirectly. There's been no escape from it. So as a consequence, I think that if governments were to go to the public and say, look, we've just been through this. What lessons have we learned? One of the lessons would be, I hope, I think, that we need to be much more cutting edge in the research that we do and finding the facilities, the physical facilities and the talent that we require to produce um, vaccines and other breakthroughs here. We're not gonna be able to compete with the United States. They have 10 times more, the Europeans, but we ought to be able to provide some degree of assurance to ourselves that comes the next time we will have a domestic capacity to deal with the problems that emerge. A second point, um, you know, 20 years ago, uh, the health department uh, actually in Ottawa proposed that we have a major investment in um, pandemic research and development of uh, vaccinations. They were gonna get the provinces involved too. Long and the short of it is that the finance department killed it and the provinces weren't interested. As I said in my remarks, the urgency of healthcare is usually delivering services today and tomorrow, not thinking 10, 15 years down the road. That may be true of all government policies. And so as a result, I hope 
that in this case, with so many people having been affected by this, that the argument that a government can make that we're investing in our ability to handle anything like this again will find a resonance that it might not have found pre-pandemic. Yeah, the, the idea of window of opportunity that has kind of filtered through your talk has really stuck with me. And you also mentioned that cultural attitudes are playing a big part. And I wonder, as a former journalist, as a journalist, what do you think um, how can our community kind of capitalize on those cultural attitudes right now? Well, this is the time to strike because the iron's hot. As I said, people are live through this unprecedented experience and will be living through it for a number of months. So the, the argument, I guess, is a, a little bit wider one than the question you raised, which is there's three broad ways that you can deal if you're a government, national government, with a pandemic like this. First of all, you can say, look, when it happens, we're gonna go out there with a checkbook and we're gonna buy as much product as we can from as many sources as we can. We're gonna diversify sources and we're gonna pay, okay? And whether the sources are from Europe or whether they're from the United States or wherever, we're just gonna go out there and buy, which is what we kind of are forced to do now. The second is that you sit down with some like-minded countries and say, look, let's develop supply chains among ourselves. So you do this, we'll do this. We'll do clinical trials here, you do clinical trials there. So we'll do it with the Americans, we'll do it with, maybe with the Mexicans, maybe with the Europeans, maybe with the Australians. You, you develop some integrated there. And the last one is you say, no, we're going to try to the greatest extent possible, we are 37, 38 million people, to develop as many capacities as we can in Canada. So the advantage of that strategy is that you then control more of your own fate, but the cost of it is higher. What we've got now is the lowest cost, but you have no control of your own fate. If the Europeans decide, and they're discussing this right now, to restrict access to or exports of pharmaceutical vaccines made in Europe to other countries, i.e. Britain and maybe Canada, you've lost control, right? So. One of those three options we should develop. I think the last one is right, but it is the most expensive. It would involve many more clinical trials in Canada. That's good. It would involve more medical research being done in Canada, which is good. It would require the construction of physical facilities in Canada, which is good, but all of which cost money, more money than waiting until things happen. And then you use your checkbook and go buy what you can. So my, my, my hunch is, that the government post this pandemic can make the argument that we need to have a domestic policy to, to research and to produce uh, vaccines. Would that spill over into other areas of medical research? One hopes so, but the focus would certainly be on vaccines to persuade the public that this is money well spent. And it'll be very, very interesting to see in the forthcoming federal budget which is going to spread money around the country with a hose, up to 100 billion additional dollars beyond the COVID spending. How much, if any of that, goes for the purposes for which we're gathered today? If it doesn't happen then, <laughs> maybe the memories will fade a bit and your the pessimistic undertone of your realistic question will unfortunately come to pass. I hope not. Well, on that, kind of in that vein, you mentioned that um, for years, Canadians have paid comparatively higher drug prices. If brand name pharma has not set up here already, so that, for example, we had vaccine capacity here like they do in the U.S., do you think if we paid more for drugs that it would happen in the future? So there's a variety of ways that you can try to induce companies to come back or to implant themselves here. Patent protection is one. That was the one that Mulroney had. Secondly, the comparable prices is another, and I, I've already sort of confessed my views on that. Thirdly, you can develop with them financing formulas whereby the government contributes a certain amount of money and the private sector does. Let's not be naive about this. You don't have to be in love with big pharma, just like you don't have to be in love with big banks or big telecom or big movie, but they're facts of life. They have capacities, as we've seen in this case and in others, that the generics don't have. So, you know, you're going to have to pay one way or the other to get those companies to install themselves in a place that has 38 million people. But it's 38 million people, and this is what you'd want to go to the companies and say, and I think they would know this, 
38 million people, but we've got a talent pool here of educational accomplishment that's higher than that of almost all European countries and certainly the United States. We have an open immigration policy, which allows us to bring talent into the country. We have no political backlash against that immigration, as you see in Europe and in the United States. And we have reasonable academic institutions. And so we, we've got an infrastructure and we've got a set of policies that make this not a bad place. The question is the economics, and it may well require the governments to invest. Look, at the moment, the government has created funds and in this budget, when the hose goes, you'll see the, the money gushing out towards clean technology companies, small and large. You'll, you'll, I mean, that's, this, is, this is what the government's gonna do. So it's, it's not unheard of that the government identifies areas of the economy and says, this we think is going to be an industry or part of the economy of the future. And I hope they see biomedicine, well, I use that word, as one of those areas. I am sure that everyone who is tuning in today feels the same. Well, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make myself popular. It's just if you look like, look at the Chinese, the Chinese aren't identifying for the next 20 years, you know, investments in, I don't know, uh, coal. I mean, although they're going to keep it coal, they're not saying we're going to become great, uh, you know, an agricultural superpower. I mean, there's a bunch of things the Chinese Communist Party is saying, you know, we're going to not do those things. We're going to do these things. We're already the leader in solar panels. We're already booming ahead in wind turbines. We're going to be first with electric vehicles and artificial intelligence. And they include what you might call biopharmacy. I mean, they've said it in their documents. So if, if the Communist Party of China, whatever its limitations in political terms and human rights terms, sets its mind on economic objectives and research objectives, you better, you, you better gear yourself up. Go back to my point. You know, the Americans under Biden know this, okay? And that's why a bunch of the money they're gonna spend are in forward looking areas. And one of the areas that Biden's already said he's gonna invest more money in is research. And so maybe the best option is to go to the Americans and say, look, in this pandemic field, so this is your middle option of supply chains jointly. Problem as we've seen though, is at the end of the day, when you get into an emergency like this, countries can tend to be rather nationalistic and say, you know, it's all very fine to share, but our citizens come first. And at the moment, we can't say that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're uh, just at the end of time here for this session. So I want to thank you again for your thank you. wonderful, it was a great pleasure. very in-depth talk. And um, I think I'm going to now introduce our next speaker. So thanks, Jeffrey. And next up, we have Dr. Fahad Razak, who will be speaking